very intimate workshop on administrators that support service learning. Um, my name is Susana Valdez, and I'm the Chief Learning Officer with the National Youth Leadership Council. I'll be introducing um, our team of experts up here. Before I do that, I did wanna um, just give a shout out to Liz Patel, who uh, is a student at the New Foundations Charter School in North Philly. And um, her dean is actually one of our panelists, and she's a member of MYLC's Youth Advisory, National Youth Advisory Council. So Liz has been handing out yellow cards that look like this. They are for your additional questions if throughout the day or the session you have additional questions you wanna write on here. She will be um, uh, collecting these and we'll be answering them at the end. I wanna, um, maybe I'll in explain the format um, first as folks are coming in and then introduce the team that's up here. So the, what we're gonna do is start out with uh, my very brief introduction of our five uh, workshop experts who are gonna be facilitating small group conversations at each of these tables. And we'll just start with a question that they're all gonna answer up here from the front and then they're gonna go to each of these tables and I will be signaling them when they will be switching. So you'll stay and the administrator will switch to another table, which means you're going to get between six and eight minutes of extremely intimate time. There's only two or three of you at a table with superintendents of schools, um, Colorado Department of Ad leaders at the state level. So some very um, significant expertise that will be rotating amongst the tables to share uh, their experiences with service learning with you and to answer any questions that you particularly have of them based on how what they share with you up front. Does that make sense? Then we'll all get back together. We'll, as a group, answer any questions that you have. So when you do that, if you would please write, this question is for Dan or it's open to the group that would be great. So I would know later um, how to direct that question so you get the answer that you are looking for. So in maybe no particular order, are you guys actually sitting in this order? That's just crazy. They're sitting in exactly this order, which is brilliant. So um, on the end, we have Dan Huberman, who is the superintendent of the Mounds View Public Schools in Minnesota. They are comprised of seven north suburban communities in the Minneapolis-St. Paul metropolitan area. Mounds View has 10,400 K-12 students with six elementary schools, three middle schools, and two comprehensive high schools. He has served in a variety of capacities in Mounds View over the last 39 years. Positions including school psychologist, special services coordinator, director of special services, director of curriculum and instruction, deputy superintendent, and now superintendent. Dan received his master's degree as an education specialist and education specialist degree from the University of St. Thomas, which for those of you that don't know is in Minnesota, it's not on a beautiful island. <laughs> Most recently, he has led a district initiative designed to address socioeconomic and racial diversity in the district called the Equity Promise. This effort also incorporates an early college program at both high schools and groundbreaking partnerships with two area colleges. So this is Dan. Next to Dan is Shira Wolf Cohn, who is an educator, community organizer, leader, and mom. Over the past decade, Shira has been involved in a wide variety of community and educational programs, including a statewide charter school coalition in Pennsylvania. She's a former teacher, after school coordinator, and dean at New Foundations Charter School and the founding camp director at Girard College, both of which are in Philadelphia. Currently, oh, and I've got the title so up here wrong. I'm sorry. Every title on the bus. <laughs> Currently, 
contrary to what it says on the slide, Shira is the vice principal at New Foundations Charter, serving 1,250 students K-12. Her areas of focus within that school are service learning, college and career development, family engagement, interdisciplinary curriculum, and out of school time learning. Next to Shira is Cody Buchanan, who was a senior consultant and community partnership specialist in the Colorado Department of Education's Dropout Prevention Unit. As his primary role, Cody is administering the federally funded 21st Century Community Learning Grant Center's grant, which funds out of school time and support uh, programming across 130 states in Colorado, uh, sites in Colorado. In addition to compliance and monitor, monitoring and technical assistance, Cody specializes in providing training and support for grantees in the areas of service learning and positive youth development. Cody also sits on the leadership team of the Colorado Service Learning Council and serves on an advisory group for Colorado's new graduation guidelines. Prior to his work with the state, Cody spent five years managing a community center housed in an urban middle school in Denver, where he facilitated numerous service learning projects with students and community members. Next to Cody, is Dr. Christiana Hang, who was the founder and superintendent of the Hmong College Prep Academy, a K-12 charter school that opened its doors in the fall of 2004. Since that time, their student enrollment has grown from 250 to over 1,130 students. Dr. Hang is the first Hmong woman to lead a successful opening of a Hmong-focused charter school. She is the superintendent for the academy the first Hmong-focused high school in the nation. She earned her Master of Arts in Organizational Management and Communications from Concordia University in St. Paul and received her doctorate in Education Administration and Superintendency from Bethel University. As a small business owner, she has decades of entrepreneurial and managerial experience, 15 years of administrative and business experience, and 10 years working in a traditional K-12 public and charter school uh, administrative roles. She currently serves as the board chair, board member, chairwoman, and president for a number of nonprofit organizations. And last but certainly not least, and I get the privilege of reading this out of our program guide, which I love. Brenda Elliott is Guilford County Schools Student Services Executive Director where she is the project manager for the district's Character Development Service Learning Initiative and this year's winner of the G. Bernard Gilt Award. So if you haven't heard more about that, I think you will later today, is that right? I think so. I think so. Um, this, so now this? Okay. <laughs> Through their Character Development Service Learning Initiative, Guilford County Schools has seen significant increase in academic achievement and graduation rates. Additionally, student misbehaviors that result in out-of-school suspensions have declined. Over the past four years, Guilford County Schools high school students have logged more than 650,000 service learning hours in support of addressing challenges in their schools and community. And just on a personal note, our largest district initiative is Guilford County Schools, 72,000 students in 129 sites. And Dan's um, team is our second largest at the moment, although we're about to add another uh, two more district partners. So we're excited about uh, the work that they're all doing in support of service learning. And I'm gonna start by asking each of you to just say a little bit about how, how and why you support service learning in the roles that you hold in the various places that you are. Dan? Okay. Um, thank you, Sue. Um, and, and you'll hear more about this uh, in your uh, rotations uh, uh, through the tables, but in, in our district about five years ago, we started down the road of an initiative called the Equity Promise. And the Equity Promise states that in our system, because we have a changing uh, demographic, that a student's race, 
their social economic status or whether or not they have a disability was not going to predict their success in our system. As we started down the road with that initiative, um, there was a lot of foundational work that needs to take place in order to make that happen. So we began looking at the research around service learning. We began looking at the research around student connectedness. Um, we began looking at ways in which our staff interacts with kids. We began and revisited issues related to habits of mind. And as we did that, uh, what we found uh, was that service learning has a, is a true complement to all of that work. Ultimately, what we're attempting to do is make sure that all of our kids have the kind of preparation and foundation that they need to be successful at that next step. As a portion of that, we've also begun a very aggressive early college program on our high school campuses, and that extends down to the middle school campuses also in terms of preparation. And as you look at that, early college, as you look at post-secondary success, as you look at student connectedness, as you look at all the things that are gonna be related around habits of mind, that if you braid all of those together, service learning becomes a very, very natural fit for that. And that's why across all three levels, uh, we're making a commitment uh, to find ways in which we can give kids those real life experiences, incorporating all of those components so that they truly are able to understand what it means to be a complete person uh, when they leave our system. Academic preparation, but also greater preparation for life. I want to give a little context because I think uh, so I'm from a single mom and pop as we call it charter school in Phil Northeast Philadelphia um, and we started as a K to 8 school uh, and we started in 2000 and the mission of our school is to develop our students not only academically but socially and emotionally to become stewards of their communities and lifelong learners our K to 8 students um, have on their shirts a caring community of learners every single day our pledge states every morning the responsibility to the community. Um, and the mission became this driving force and how do, does this happen? How do we make sure that our mission is being met? There's tons of districts and schools that have this mission and it's really about what tangible um, programs and initiatives and things you can do and adopt to become successful. So New Foundation, um, we adopted a caring school community model, which is put out by the Developmental Study Center, and it basically says exactly what our mission says, that um, the tools that we put in place are gonna be easily transformed into caring communities where students feel safe and they feel connected. Um, and that became the basis for what we started doing. Our students started having class meetings where they were reflecting with teachers on a similar level, and they started um, having family nights and we started purposefully sending home activities at night that required parent or adult inter input. Um, I came to the school in the second year actually as a first year teacher and I was given an opportunity and I'd just come off a year of AmeriCorps and was told you have a period once a week with a group of kids and what are you going to do with it? And so I said well I'm going to do service learning. Um, and during that semester the principal then he's now the CEO, would come into my classroom and he would be like, this is really awesome. Like, it was uh, organized chaos, always students working, but that wasn't what, you know, people were used to. So, um, actually what ended up happening was that we started to go to service learning conferences. I had gone as a AmeriCorps member and I said, you know what, I wanna take some staff and some students here, and this was 13 years ago, and to Minneapolis, and it really spurred a lot of great stuff for our school. Um, so if you fast forward 10 years in 2010, we actually were granted a high school. And in Philadelphia, that is not something that happens with charter schools. Uh, you have to be performing, and we were. Um, and we were granted back in 2010 a high school. We opened it in six weeks with 110 uh, freshmen. There are now, a four years later, 112 seniors who are graduating, and 100% of them are, in, are accepted to colleges. Over 50% are getting scholarships. And we've developed 
uh, standards for service learning. So not only do we have our academic standards, but our teachers have our service learning standards that we've developed that connect our caring school community with our mission. We have certain lenses, we like to call it. We have a lens for social issues in K-8 to and in 9th through 12th, it's careers. So um, we really are working hard to have our students be prepared. Um, we, I think that my personal, you know, experience made it something that um, is why I am supportive of it because I was personal experience and I think in the smaller groups we'll be able to talk a little bit more about what those lenses look like and what we do and what our programs are and things like that. So. Uh, my name is Cody Buchanan. I'm with the Colorado Department of Education. I'm a consultant, primarily, my primary role is as a consultant on the 21st Century Community Learning Centers grant. Uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but that is a federally funded grant that uh, pays for out of school time programming for students and families in 139 states, I mean 139 sites in uh, Colorado uh, and numerous other states throughout the country. My primary role within our team is uh, monitoring and technical assistance of uh, the grantees and uh, specifically providing training and assistance around service learning and positive youth development. Uh, as Susanna mentioned, um, I come from a background of working at a nonprofit, kind of facilitating uh, service learning activities. We were a recipient of the 21st Century Grant, uh, and that's how I kind of made the transition to the state level. When I got to the state, um, we had recently lost funding in the Federal Learn and Serve Grant. And that was really, at the time, the, the only mechanism that the state of Colorado had to promote service learning uh, in among the districts and students throughout the state. Uh, so kind of by default, um, as the service learning expert on our team, it was realized that uh, I was really the only person in the department who had service learning in their job description and, and had a level of service learning expertise. So um, I've been tasked with helping to generate and keep momentum at the state level for service learning with very little federal money to, to support that. Uh, so a lot of what we've done is, um, and, and again, I'll talk about it a little bit more in the small groups, um, we've developed a Colorado Service Learning Council uh, through partnerships with various nonprofits uh, who have, like the department, um, been willing to donate staff time to kind of generate and keep momentum behind service learning, provide resources for uh, individuals and organizations that are looking to implement service learning, and um, basically just be uh, a champion, if you will, for, for service learning in the state. One of my other roles is to help our s grantees at our 139 schools to connect with their school and their district. Uh, a lot of times our, our grantees uh, work pretty independently from the school in, in the out of school time arena. Uh, so part of my responsibility is helping make that connection between uh, the out of school time and connecting back to the day school learning through service learning and help kind of, again, champion service learning uh, and, and drum up some support at the school and district level as well. Good afternoon, my name is uh, Christiana Hang and, and currently I'm the superintendent for the Hmong College Prep Academy. Thanks for being here this afternoon. Um, why service learning? Uh, well, you know, our charter school began in the year 2000, and we actually got charter as a, as a high school first, K-12 K, K charter, but we began as a high school. And the reason why we began as a high school, I'll, I'll just give you uh, a tie back to um, the reason why, because kids were very really disengaged from learning, and they were dropping out of middle school as a, as a traditional administrator myself, what I saw. Um, so we, we wanted to create a charter school that has a mission to provide the best in integrative education for K-12 students. And how do we do that so that we can bring the sparks back to kids' education in their eyes? Um, and through, um, you know, that whole, the charter, the research for our charter, um, we, we began by 
looking into how do we provide 21st century skills for our kids. So we became uh, known as a college preparatory um, high school, preparing kids for the um, post-secondary option or, or you know, life after high school. And with that, we um, visited many, many model schools in the East Coast, in California and other places where they have college preparatory um, programs. And um, borrowing some of those great ideas, we came up with a program called the C3 program, which stands for, the three C stands for care, college, and career. And part of the care is where we do the college, the uh, college preparatory as well as the service learning program. And we teach our kids to, um, uh, to do, part of the caring is to care about yourself and to care about the world around you and to integrate themselves in the community as well as involve their parents. Uh, we, we have about 85% free reduced lunch kids and we serve a majority of minority kids who don't have the opportunity to um, have pride in themselves or um, to be engaged in the community or to integrate themselves into, um, into the, the real world skills. So that's the reason why we have created um, uh, or explore the service learning into the care part. And so we have kids come up with ideas, for example, that they, you know, on, uh, we have specific curriculums for the care, college, and career component, but part of service learning is they would come up with um, different themes. So, uh, for example, one year we would do Feed the Hunger, and the kids would go to, um, they would go out to the community, for example, and they would um, generate um, ideas and they would, they would cook meals for um, homeless kids. Or they would go to uh, nursing homes and they would cook uh, for the elderly, for example. And we, we feel that um, through the CARE program, uh, the service learning really helps sparks the kids to really connect in their learning, attendance go up, dropout rates go down, um, you know, kids graduation rate in, in our district rates around any cohort graduates at 95% versus before kids were not graduating and that really helped um, connect the kids into um, more than just seat work and have a hands-on learning um, with the community as well as with parent involvement. So we do a lot of educating with parents through, uh, through our parent academies as well. We have them ongoing throughout the year and we teach the parents about what the kids are doing and learning inside the school through service learning opportunities that they have within their school. So we even have things like um, the high schoolers, they would um, do the ser service learning program, and I'll give you an example later, where they learn how to swim, um, partnership with YMCA um, and other foundations, and they would teach it to the younger kids. Um, and then they also teach it to special ed kids. So that's, that's an example of how they provide service learning through our district and, and helping the community and helping parents to understand that what they're learning in the district or the school is more than just, um, you know, their seat work. Uh, good morning. Thank you guys for the opportunity to present. Um, uh, so uh, Sue's told you a lot about us already. So I'm going to just focus on, w you know, what is my passion behind the service learning work and then um, hopefully I'll get a chance to share a little bit more specifically about what our district is doing. And I came up with seven things, I'll be real brief. Um, the first thing I, I say is behind our passion in our district is that um, we and our teachers feel that this is really a revolt against standardized testing and this culture <laughs> to, <laughs> woo -hoo, this culture to teach to the test. And uh, we believe there are, are a whole lot of other things that matter that cannot be measured on a standard test, test that are essential to our future as a nation, as a world, and what our young people do. Um, number two, um, we found out that this, you know, this type of authentic, engaged teaching is what most educators came to teaching for. And when we, you know, do our service learning institutes, what we hear from them, we see teachers who, I mean, their eyes just really light up. This is why I joined the profession, to help that light bulb go off for young people. Um, on the student side, it answers the question for young people, why am I learning this? So I appreciate Dr. Uh, the doctor to my right here, and I just met her, so I'm, 
Christiana, Dr. Christiana's comment that, you know, this, is, this answers the question for young people, why am I learning this? Because it engages young people. And what we saw was, and I think across the nation, most of the children that graduate, I mean, excuse me, that drop out from school actually have a C average. Uh, there was a big thing that was done on the Oprah show. So young people are not dropping out because they can't do the work. It is, it is not connected to their current life or their future life. They don't see the connection. And service learning helps us to make those connections for among young people. Um, number four, it empowers young people and um, helps them to establish their relevance in the world. Um, and they are able to see how I contribute, how I matter, um, how my world and my community need me. So it's more than just the relevance. Now it's I am needed here. I am significant here. Um, and I have an ability to influence my life course as well as what my world becomes. Um, number five, I think it builds a sense of empathy and a sense of social justice and environmental responsibility that is going to be a lot more important in the long run than whether our kids are excellent in calculus or any other content area. Um, and I think, you know, when we think about most of our school's mission statements or district mission statements talk about um, to develop responsible citizens who have academic or highly academic scholars um, and ready for college and career in the world. And we totally skip over the responsible citizen. You know, we do very little to, to help be sure that we have intelligent people who will do responsible things with that intelligence. And we can, we can cite probably um, many, many examples of where people with great intelligence have done really horrific things, um, even just looking in the last eight years in our nation. Um, number uh, six, it adds millions of dollars of service and innovation to our uh, economy, economy that I mean otherwise would not be there or, or that we could afford. Um, our students in Guilford County in the past uh, four years have logged more than 650,000 hours of service with an economic impact of more than $16 million. Um, you know, everybody's budget's tight. And these are services that our community needs, our senior citizens need, um, in the tutoring programs that our students participate in. There are all of these things that we need that we don't have some money machine <laughs> to go pay for those things. And, I, and we, we feel in Guilford County, we are just starting to measure that economic impact that our youth are making. And it is very significant. Um, and I think that's one of the great things that when we sell service learning to people, why it's so important. And then finally, it gives us hope. Um, it gives me hope. I, when I see young people, the things that they come up to solve problems that adults have struggled with so for so long, I am very hopeful and very optimistic about the future of our nation and of our world. So thank you. Elaine, you know, the, the things we learned in Guilford County, the things we learned in Moundsview that worked and did not work, we've evolved the model so that uh, it will work more broadly in more places regardless of whether or not you have five people at the district office responsible for service learning as they have in Guilford, or if they have 11 schools um, in Moundsview and you have one or you have 50. So I just wanted to share um, that quick thing because the folks that are on this panel, we've learned, NYLC has learned a lot uh, from them uh, as we develop our, and we're responsible for, training their staff and uh, supporting their teams. So you can see why we invited this particular group of folks to join us today. Uh, are there those of you out there that have a question you wanted to pose? Yes, we do some fundraising. I'm not gonna say we don't, we look for some outside grants. We are lucky we're a 501c3 in addition to it being a school district, in addition to being an independent school, so we can apply for that. However, service learning doesn't cost money. Like, I, I don't know another way to say that, but it doesn't cost money. If you are doing it the right way, it doesn't cost money. If you're saying, well, we have no money to take kids to a service site, well, 
you don't have to take kids to a service day. Um, there shouldn't be a reason to not do service learning because of not money, because if it's how you teach, that doesn't cost money. Everyone teaches how they teach, and I think um, the learn and serve money was great. It provided, I mean, we never had to think about where anything would come from. Oh, you, you need, you wanna get a bus to go on a field trip to do this, great. Oh, you wanna have, need all these supplies that are probably unnecessary, but great. Oh, we wanna buy new cameras, great. But the bottom line is to do service learning good, you don't need the extra money. And if you can get people to buy into it as a method of teaching, not a method, not something else we do, then it doesn't cost money. And field trips are something else we do and they cost money. But service learning is not. I, wa I wanna interject one thing though. Recognize this is a team of people that did start with learn and serve money and all their teacher professional development and the structures inside their schools and the culture and the handbooks and the materials and the reinforcement was in place before Learn and Serve went out of their doors. So now not they can, not you, okay. So, so, so we didn't have Learn and Serve to start with. And um, I know people have probably read the article, The Depth of Service Earning, and when I read that, I said, oh my God, do not let my superintendent see this because <laughs> to people saying that it's dead and we are just finding out about it. And I think that's the case for much of K-12 that, that I've uh, interacted with. P they don't even know that, many folks don't know that this is an instructional strategy. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I guess that's one of the things that I wanna say that um, y when you think about, so what are the resources to support um, other instructional strategies in your school? Right, and many people don't have them. This is a way of teaching. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I kind of want to echo that as well, real quick. Um, it, you know, what my colleague here said, it, it's just elbow grease sometimes, you know, putting in the work to, to identify who are the champions in the community, who are the organizations in the community that are looking to partner around service learning, how do you capture and share your successes around service learning to generate support and to kind of, uh, again, generate and build momentum within your building, uh, identifying who are the teachers that are interested in, in helping with, with putting together projects after school or before school or during lunch. Uh, you know, don't be afraid to start small and make sure to capture all of those successes, uh, anecdotal or, or quantitative. Um, either way, you know, being able to, to talk about the successes that you've had in, in service learning is the easiest way to generate support among your administrators, among fellow teachers, and among your districts. I just, wanna, I just wanna add one more thing, which is that I think that it's important that, that you are able to look at your service learning that you wanna do through the lens of the funding that you have. Um, we, you know, we ha also had a 21st Century Community Learning Center grant uh, in Pennsylvania, and it really helped for us. We looked and we designed our program through a lens of service learning. Um, our Title I program in my Title I budget, I have for after school career related um, or you know career <coughs> exposure after school programs which allow me to do graphic design and robotics and um, culinary clubs and all of these things that also then do service learning through those programs. So um, you have to look at it through the lens that you have and the funding that you do have. I mean, people don't, you know, most of us have to pr provide a proposal for our Title I funds for each year or a proposal for any other, you know, whether there's school safety or after school or 21st century, include that in there. It's not something extra. It's something that is a part or a way that you might do something again. So it makes sense to do that and mm -hmm. do it through that way. I would just like to echo that, um, you know, what she said about, and what he said about, you know, service learning doesn't cost money. If you can convince your superintendent, and you know, like the gentleman here wanted to, as a system principal wants to integrate service learning into the daily teaching and learning. Um, at our school district, we just made it part of the curriculum. It's a part of the daily teaching and learning. It's not a side thing, it's not an after school thing. So we already know, you know, we, we, we have the usual grants as a, as a charter school, Title I, Special Ed, all that, and, and general funds. We pretty much just built it in and just say, you know, um, this is, 
this is a part of how you do teaching and learning. And it doesn't have to be a side thing. Um, you, you know, you already set enough money for field trip buses. You already, you know, it, it's just a, what it needs is just the creativity of the teachers and the kids want to do a project together and go out there and find partnerships like we did with the YMCA partnership or Abbott no Northwest. It doesn't cost us any money to do that. And you know, the way that I was give it, giving you guys an example about how we did the swim and lesson was the high school, we started with a, a very creative high school teacher and a, a group of students. They become um, swimmer instructors and then we weaved in the little kids, the first you know kindergarten to fifth grade and we say, okay, it's your turn to be mentees, to be swimmers with us. And it, you know, pretty soon service learning just streams itself down to kindergarten without the teachers even knowing. They're like, oh my God, we're doing service learning. You know, so it doesn't have to cost money if you just um, you know, ask your teachers and your principals to be creative. Thanks, and, I, and think about the, uh, I think the critical integration into the curriculum is really important. So think about all of the curricular uh, standards can, that can be met by studying buoyancy and rate and distance and et cetera through swimming. So I wanted to show you this video. It's from a local news, it's in a CBS affiliate, I think, right? Um, is that little, is, is, it, is that CBS, yes. The, yes, CBS, the symbol? That's what I thought. It's a CBS affiliate in Minnesota. This is, um, maybe, Christiana, you wanna tee us up here? Cause this sure. is your kids. Yes, um, this is a project we, our high school students did um, just recently here and it stemmed from the swimming uh, project. Uh, last year, during bef right before prom, there was a fatal accident involving one of the swimmer instructor, and it happened to be a swimmer instructor to the high school students that went to learn, s learn how to swim at YMCA. And um, the students got very passionate about it, actually very angry, because the kid who actually hit the, in uh, the instructor, who was a passenger, the driver passed away, but the passenger was, was the swimmer the instructor got hurt very, very, very critically, and the, drive, the drunk driver was a monk student, was a monk kid. Um, so uh, a lot of my high school students said, okay, how can we bring this awareness to the community? How can we get parents involved? How do we get the community involved? How do we get this to the, um, to the greater community and, and teens to stop uh, driving drunk, uh, to, to stop drinking and drive, and text and drive? So they came up, they, they called the chief of St. Paul police, to got involved and they called the fire stations and they got the community involved and they got the newscast involved. And um, you know, our teachers were just facilitator and the group of students, they, you know, they got themselves into roles like who's the director, who's gonna write the script, um, who's gonna play what role, who's gonna wear the prom dress, who, you know, which car should we use? So we, we got St. Paul Police um, Department involved as well and they donated a car. So they actually did the simulation of uh, two simulation, one was uh, the kid driving drunk and one was uh, the kid taxing and driving and how the fatal accident happened. So this thing is from uh, driving drunk. So. so this is the newscast coverage of that student project. Emergency vehicles responded to a fatal crash today that was staged for the cameras. Shattered glass and bloodied faces made the scene look all too real for the teenagers who were behind the production. Students from St. Paul's Mung College Prep Academy spent the day producing two public service announcements. They hope that their messages convinced teen drivers to refrain from mixing, drinking, texting, and driving. And Bill Hudson was on their Hollywood-like set today. He's here now to explain. Very meaningful assignment for these kids today, you guys. Absolutely. It all began as a class project, but it quickly grew into quite a production. With the help of the Ramsey County Sheriff's Office, Lake Johanna Fire, and a line of paramedics, what they put on video will be a sobering reminder to all young drivers. This afternoon, guys, um, we are going to have the crash scene. Fire is on scene. Eric Zakowski's social studies class had a unique assignment today. We're just gonna plan to maybe put a camera in the car so you can actually see the car's impact. His students at Mung College Prep Academy are about to make a statement, one, that can save lives. I can get behind it with the squad and, sh and shove it. With the help of first responders, they're taping two public service announcements aimed squarely at the fatal dangers of drinking or texting while driving. 
Nick Jong is directing the productions. If we make this video, maybe it can help prevent and make other teenagers think about, what. Well, look, if, if they're going to look like that, they're going to end up in the hospital and some dead. It's, it's scary. Students are first dressed for prom, then put into realistic makeup, faces and heads bloodied. It's already scary enough looking at them with all that blood. It's like, uh, like do I really want them to happen like this? The message is made when the two cars carrying 10 kids crash. Four of them are killed, the others seriously hurt. The images of disbelief and terror captured loud and clear. I don't want people to like experience the loss of a, a, a close friend or family member. Yeah, that's really the bottom line here. Now, they actually shot enough scenes for the two separate scripts today, one each on texting, another on drinking and driving, mm -hmm. a very efficient film crew to say the least. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Pretty intense too, Bill. And I'm sure people are wondering where can we see these public service announcements? Yeah, they want these. These are intended not just for young students, young drivers, but they want the public to see them as well. They want everyone to see them. They say that they'll probably take a couple of weeks to edit these down into uh, three, four, five minute videos, then post them on YouTube and Facebook. And they're really aimed for the visibility before the very dangerous prom season this spring. Pretty interesting. I think they'll have quite an yeah. impact. Thank you, Bill. Sure thing. So very often, one of the big questions that I get is, what does it look like in the classroom? And this is what it looks like. And it was driven, as Christiana said, by students who specifically had an interest, and it was relevant to them. But again, the academic standards that they can hit from a numerous um, perspectives, whether it's the technology links, the impact that uh, alcohol has on the body, and uh, you can think of a thousand other connections that this social studies teacher was able to do across the curriculum with these students, with the students driving forward uh, the, the reason for the study in the first place. And I think it goes back to what Shira said in the very beginning, which is it's, um, it's busy, it's loud, it's a different kind of structure and organization to classrooms than what we might be used to. It's not kids in rows. It's not, it's, you know, it's, it's messier than that. And it's true authentic learning. So I want to thank our group of facilitators. If you would join me in thanking them.